Donc, je suis né euh, donc à Quimper, donc en Bretagne, ici. Et j'ai fait toutes mes études euh, enfin, en Bretagne, après à l'école centrale de Lyon. Et en 2000, je suis allé au Japon, ça fait presque 20 ans, donc. Euh, et je fais mon master et doctorat à l'université de Tokyo. Et après, j'ai fait toute ma carrière au Japon, en post-doc. Euh, en maître de conférence et puis enfin, en informatique à Tokyo, à Kyoto et maintenant en mathématiques à Nagoya. Et donc je travaille sur euh, enfin, l'informatique théorique au sens large et en particulier les algorithmes, la complexité et surtout l'informatique quantique. Voici. Donc je vais, je vais changer un peu à l'anglais parce que c'est plus simple pour moi vu que toutes les slides sont faites en en anglais. Okay, so here is the outline of the talk. So I will start with an overview of quantum computation. Then I will discuss um, briefly the main results known about quantum distributed computation. And then if I have time, I will go in more details in one of the first important result in this field, so this paper, and I will end with a few co conclusions and a few uh, open problems. Okay, so we start with uh, a quantum computation. So quantum computation is uh, a computation paradigm based on the laws of quantum mechanics. So I need to explain a little bit uh, what is a quantum mechanics. So I will just give some intuition about the basic ideas. So let's consider one uh, photon, for example. So the laws of quantum mechanics say that the position of one photon is not fixed. It's described at what we call a wave function. So we never really know until we measure it where the photon is precisely. And a wave function can be described very easily uh, for discrete, discrete systems, which is what we really care about in quantum computation. And so I will take, start with a case of a two-state physical system. So you have two states, state zero and state one. So if you have a classical system, so a system following the laws of classical um, mechanics, the system can be in state one or in state zero, two possibilities. Or if it's a probabilistic process, it can be a probability distribution over zero and one, okay? The probability distribution is described by a vector like this, PQ, uh, satisfying these conditions. Okay, so now if you have an end state physical system, if it's a classical system, it will be in one of n possible states. And if it's a probabilistic process, it will be a probability distribution over the n possible states. Okay, so it's represented by a vector like this. n coordinates, all positive, summing to one. So now the quantum case, so if the particle follows the laws of quantum mechanics, Quantum mechanics says that it is described by a wave function. And the wave function is essentially very similar to what we have here, it's very close to a, a, probability, a probability distribution, but there are two main differences, which is that the components here are complex number, not positive number, but complex number. And we are considering here the norm two instead of the norm one. Okay, so norm two that should be equal to one. Okay, and here pi was a probability that the particle is in state i. Now it's the square of the absolute value of alpha i. Okay, two main differences, this and this. And this um, has a lot of consequences. The fact that uh, you allow negative numbers and more generally complex numbers makes interferences possible. And the fact that you have a square here instead of uh, a one here makes convergence faster. And the main goal of quantum computation is to exploit these differences in order to do computation faster than with standard computers. Okay, so 
uh, let me uh, come to the history of uh, quantum computation. So this basic idea of uh, building computers based on the laws of quantum mechanics started in uh, the 80s by Feynman and Deutsch. There was a experiment, the first experiment in the 90s. They got, uh, Weinland and Arosh got the Nobel Prize in uh, physics uh, eight years ago for that. But the real start of quantum computation came with the discovery of fast quantum algorithm by Shor for integer factoring and Grover for quantum search. Especially Shor algorithms factorize integers exponentially faster than the best known um, current algorithm. Okay, and they are based on this uh, exploiting the interferences and making uh, convergence faster using the fact that we want to, um, to optimize the uh, norm two and not the norm. Okay, and I would like to mention um, some kind of misconception about quantum um, mechanics and quantum computation. It's a very important thing, important thing. So I would really like to make this very clear. So the point is that we often hear that quantum computing is fast since it performs computation in parallel. This is actually true in some sense, but simply performing computation in parallel using quantum superposition does not lead, lead to any speed up since the amplitudes of bad computation outcomes will be very high. So to really exploit the power of quantum computation, you really need to cleverly manipulate the quantum state using, for example, interferences in order to increase the probability of getting good outcomes. And this clever manipulation is a very subtle process. And the first example of a successful clever manipulation was done by Grover that showed that you can very cleverly um, manipulate quantum states so that you can get enough information in order to factor an integer extremely fast in the quantum computer. Okay. So quantum computation exploits superposition. So it enables you to do some kind of parallel um, computation. But if you don't do anything besides that, it does not give you any speed up. You really need to do some kind of clever manipulation of the quantum state, which is fairly difficult to do, but in some cases you can do and then you can obtain a speed up with respect to classical uh, computation. Okay, so this was the 80s. Then there was a discovery of quantum error corrections showing that even if you have noise, you can protect your quantum data from noise using error, correction, error correcting codes. And after that, there was a real, what we call the first quantum boom, about 10 years of very active research on quantum computation. So in the 80s, with several projects, for example, in Japan. And now we started this, what we call the second boom. Since, since 2014 or 15, a lot of companies like IBM, Google, have succeeded in constructing small quantum computers. So the second boom really um, witnesses the start of uh, the realization of a small, small scale quantum computers. Mm -hmm. And I would like to give more details about that. So these um, slides um, record um, the size of the quantum computer discovered so far. So basically um, here you have uh, the horizontal axis is, so sorry, I will probably there's a timing option of my slides. So I need probably to not use timing otherwise a little bit. Okay. Okay, so here you have uh, the year, and here you have the size of the quantum computer um, measured as the number of quantum bits, qubits. It's not the only parameter to discuss the size of a computer, but it's a very important uh, parameter. And you see in 2014, we had basically five quantum bits, then 10, in 2018, basically 20, 
And now we have 50 and maybe seven, 17 uh, really um, in 2020, we have some uh, IBM is, um, has developed a 70 qubit quantum computer. Okay, so you see it's increasing a bit. Uh, maybe it uh, looks like a quantum model, we never know, but um, the really important point is that in order to do really meaningful quantum computation, what we call universal quantum computing, like integer factoring, you need a huge number of quantum bits. You need a quantum computer of say 1 million uh, quantum bits. So we are still very, very far from that. And we never know, we don't know at this point when we will reach this barrier, maybe 2030, 40, 50, maybe never, we don't know. But if you look at the data, it's still increasing pretty fast since 2040. Okay, so it looks like some kind of quantum world. And I would like to mention a very um, celebrated result uh, from uh, two years ago by Google. So Google um, announces that, uh, so they had a quantum computer here, 53 qubits, so this is this point. And they make an experiment and uh, they somehow proved that the outcome of the computation performed by this chip cannot be uh, simulated classically. It's take a lot of time, even on a classical supercomputer. Okay, it's not a formal proof. And indeed, there are a lot of uh, contact claims by IBM saying that actually it's not so long. You can do it in a few days. But still, it's a very strong um, evidence, concrete evidence that quantum computation can currently do computation that cannot be done, quantum computers can do computation that cannot be done with uh, even supercomputers, okay? And this is what we call quantum supremacy, okay? We are able to do experiments, computation, using a quantum computer, small quantum computer that cannot be simulated with classical quantum computers, okay? And uh, so, um, the two central direction of uh, recent research on quantum computing can be divided in, um, in um, well, it can be summarized uh, in this way. So first, the first one is really that, what I will discuss today, it's understanding what can be done with a large scale quantum computer, universal quantum computer. Okay, and I will discuss that mainly, mainly today. And the second uh, main uh, research area is to understand what can we be done with the kind of quantum computer achievable in the next 10, 20 years, okay? Computers, quantum computer achieving quantum supremacy. So they are doing quantum computations that cannot be simulated classically, but it's not enough to do this kind of universal quantum computer. Okay, so the two are very important uh, research um, fields. And today I will mostly discuss this. Okay. So what can we do with a large scale quantum computer? It's a very important question because it will take a lot of time, money and efforts to build a quantum computer. So you really need to understand whether it's worth it or not. And what can we do? So I mentioned we have Shor algorithm for integer factoring and Grover algorithm for quantum search. Shor algorithm breaks RSA crypto system, so it's good. And Grover search performs search faster than brute force search, which is also good. But actually, for even if it breaks crypto system, sure, algorithm breaks crypto system, it may not be a big deal because there is a simple solution, which is to replace RSA with another kind of crypto system. For example, lattice based crypto system. We don't believe that quantum computer will be able to break lattice based crypto system. And for search, well, of course, quantum computers are faster than brute force search. Yes, but for many problems, even hard problems, there are clever classical algorithms that do better than brute force search. It's not clear whether quantum computer can be useful for, for this problem, okay? So this 
on the, the Shor algorithm and Grover algorithm are not extremely convincing and very useful applications of quantum computer. And we really need to find more quantum algorithms to justify the construction of such large scale quantum computers. And there has been a lot of research on quantum co algorithm uh, in the past uh, 20 years. There is even a website called the Quantum Algorithm Zoo. You can find uh, the address here. That lists all the quantum algorithm discovered so far. It starts with factoring, then discrete log, and so on. And well, I look at it at the beginning of the month, and there are essentially, well, 430 references, so more or less 100 quantum algorithms discovered so far. Okay, so it's not a big number because, well, the field started more than 20 years ago. So 100 algorithms, quantum algorithms in 20 years, this means five per year which is quite slow for a field like um, quantum computation. Okay, and um, so I've been working on quantum algorithm for more than 20 years on several projects. And today I would like to, um, to talk about one project that I am really working actively on recently, which is quantum distributed computation. Okay. So this is, uh, yes, so this is the end of the first part of the talk, this overview of quantum computation. If there is any question, something which is not clear at this point, I can answer it, or if not, I will continue. Is it okay? Okay. Okay, so let's, uh, the second part. Quantum distributed computing. Okay, the point is that quantum distributed computing and quantum distributed algorithm have not been studied so much. They have been studied mostly in the case of two parties. So two party is some kind of very simple distributed computing, but it does not capture the essence of a distributed computing. And if you look at really result focusing on many party, there are only, there were, until recently, there was only three papers, three main papers. That one about the leader election on anonymous networks. And for non-anonymous networks, this and this. But these two papers are negative results. So they show the impossibility of quantum distributed computing faster than classical distributed computing for many important problems. Okay, so for many important problems, they show that quantum does not help. So the question is really, is there some problems for which quantum can help? And I've been working on that uh, in the past three years. And as I will explain in a few minutes, there are two main models uh, in distributed computing for theoretical investigation, congest model, local model. And we have shown that quantum can be useful in both models, okay? So they are the first, these results are basically the first positive results about the, the, um, the power of quantum computation in quantum dis in distributed computing. And I will discuss uh, this in the, in the remaining of, uh, of the talk. Okay, so let me explain uh, the model we are considering, which are essentially the main model for theoretical investigation of distributed computing. So I will start with the classical setting, okay? So it's a model for theoretical investigation. So we are assuming some kind of ideal situation where there is no fault, uh, everything is synchronous, all communication is perfect, and so on. There is no noise and so on. So you have a network of n nodes. Okay, so each node is a processor and each age is a communication channel. And we assume that all nodes have a distinct uh, ID. And we assume that each node knows only the ID of its neighbors. So for example, node four here knows that it is connected to one, three and six. 
but knows nothing else about the topology of the network. So it has a, a really local view of the network, doesn't know the global topology of the network. Maybe, well, we can assume that you know the number, the total number of nodes, but only that. And communication is synchronous and occurs between adjacent nodes. So one message is sent through each edge per round. Okay, so communication occurs round by round. And at round one, all the nodes exchange a message. Okay. Then there is some local computation. Then we move to round two and they exchange all their message. Then again, local computation and communication and so on. And we are interested in the number of rounds needed to solve the, some problem, to compute something. Okay, so we don't really care about the local computation time. We don't really care about the total amount of bits exchanged. We care about the total number of run, rounds needed for the computation. And an important parameter is the size of the message. And there are two kinds of message models. You can assume that the message are small, concretely log n bits, because log n is exactly what you need to send one ID. Okay, so small message or unlimited size message, no restriction. And both models are, uh, have some um, good motivation. For example, this one is the motivated for the setting where communication is extremely cheap and fast. So you don't really care about the, the number of bits sent by the message. You care about the number of rounds needed to reach a conclusion. And the quantum setting is the same, but now we allow quantum message. That is, each wire here, its uh, age is a quantum channel. You can think of an optical fiber. And the message, a quantum message. So we are sending photons instead of bits. Okay. And we are asking whether allowing this kind of quantum message makes computation easier in that setting. Okay. And we are considering the same kind of complexity. We consider the number of rounds needed for the computation. Okay, and in the congest model, again, we allow only short message, short quantum message, and the local model, there is no restriction on the size of each message. And what we have shown is that the first result is um, that there exists a problem, a very concrete problem for which quantum help. This is computing the diameter of the network. You have the network, you want to compute the diameter. I will explain what the diameter is in a few, sec in a few minutes. Quantumly, you can do it in square root n rounds, where n is the number of nodes of the network. And quantumly, you need, uh, sorry, quantumly square root n and classically n rounds, linear in n. And you can even prove a classical lower one. So this gives a gap, a quadratic gap between the power of classical and quantum distributed computation. Okay, and then we have shown uh, that there is also a gap for another problem, triangle finding. And then we considered the local model. So local model, again, is no restriction on the size of the message. So we need to compare the power of unbounded amount of quantum communication and unbounded amount of classical communication, which looks uh, fairly challenging. And there was a prior work by uh, Cyril Gabriel and the collaborators sh showing that there is a problem that can be solved quantumly in one round, but require two rounds classical. There is a, a small gap between quantum and classical, one round versus two rounds. And the paper is a very nice paper, and they mentioned that the factor two may be a natural limit and so on. And for a few months, I also believed that it was a natural limit. But we were able to show it's not a natural mid limit. Actually, you can do much uh, better. There exists another computational problem that can be solved in two rounds quantumly. But classically, you need a linear number of them. So you have a huge gap between the power of classical and quantum in the local model. 
the problem is a little bit uh, artificial. So for the diameter and triangle findings, they are very concrete problem. Here we are talking about artificial problem, problem artificially created in order to show a gap between classical and quantum. It's not something really useful, but uh, at least it shows that there can be some gap between classical and quantum. Okay, and now I will, on the remaining of the talk, I will focus on that result and I will give a slightly more technical presentation of that. Okay. And there is some question at this point. Okay, so I will try to explain a little bit this. So first, what is the diameter? So the diameter of a graph is the maximum distance between two nodes. Okay, so the distance between the two most remotely, um, the, the most far apart nodes, two nodes of the graph. So for example, here the distance is four because the most remote vertices are F and G and their distance is four. Another very um, important quantity is the eccentricity of a node. Okay, the eccentricity of U is a max over all V of the distance between U and V. Okay, so for example, the eccentricity of A is three, the eccentricity of B is three and so on. And of course you see that the D is the maximum eccentricity. Because the max of U V, they are taking the max of U and the max of V. And we will use that characterization later. Okay. So now classical computing. So I will give you one example of classical computation. Computation of the distance. And we will use that specific algorithm in a few minutes. So that's the reason why I explained it uh, a little bit carefully. So assume that you want to compute as a distance from node one in a network. What should you do? There is a trivial protocol. So the distance, the answer is of course two because the distance between one and six is, is two, okay? The trivial protocol is called the breadth first search algorithm. And it starts by this node one, which is of course a distance zero from itself sending a message to its neighbors. Okay, send a message here, here, and here. Okay, and all the nodes that receive a message know that they are distance one from, th from this uh, node. So they update their distance. Two know that it is a distance one, three know that it is a distance one, four know that it is a distance one. And at the second round, all these nodes tell their new knowledge neighbors, okay? So two send a message to all its neighbors, three send a message to all its neighbors, and four also. And all the nodes that receive for the first time a message at the second round know that they are distance two from one. Okay, so they update their information. They know that they are distance two. Okay, this one is a distance one because you receive a new message, but it's not the first message it is. Okay, and if you do this, it's, you see that what you get is at the end, each node knows its distance from node one. And what is the complexity? It's exactly the eccentricity of one, this node, which is at most zero. Okay, so it's a very simple uh, algorithms, distributed algorithm. It's probably the, one of the most uh, sim the, the simplest uh, useful um, distributed algorithm. And the complexity is very efficient. It's a D round, at most D rounds. Okay. Okay, so you can compute the distances from one specific node in D rounds. This means that you can compute one eccentricity in D rounds. You start at U and you use a breadth first search algorithm starting at U and what you get is the eccentricity of U. So now the diameter, as I said, is the maximum eccentricity. Okay. 
But computing the diameter requires a linear amount of runs, even if D is constant. Because you cannot, you need to compute the maximum eccentricity, but you cannot use this algorithm simultaneously for all, starting with all not U, because it will lead to congestions. Okay? And actually, you can show that it's nothing that you can do because there is a lower bound of N, even for um, networks of a small uh, diameter. It's the computation of the diameter, the computation of the eccentricity, the maximum eccentricity is hard, at least classically. Computing one eccentricity is not very hard, but computing the maximum eccentricity is hard. And we have shown that we can do better in the quantum setting. So here is um, our main result. Um, we've shown that quantumly, we have an upper bound of square root nd. So when d is small, you can think of d constant, then this gives you square root n, and here uh, n, which is optimal. So this gives you a quadratic gap when d is small. We also have some a lower bound, which uh, one unconditional lower bound here, and one conditional, there's a small condi technical condition on the lower bound, which is actually optimal. So matches this up. Okay. Okay, so, um, and we also some result for uh, approximating the diameter and so on, but I will skip this result. I will only discuss this, uh, this up. So how do you obtain uh, an improvement for computing the diameter in the quantum setting? So let's consider a slightly simpler problem, which is a decision version of the diameter problem. I give you an integer d, and I ask you to decide if the diameter is larger than, for example, I, ask, I give you d equal 100, and I ask you to decide whether the network has diameter larger than 100. What does it mean? That means that we need to decide if there exists a vertex u of eccentricity larger than D, okay? So this is really a search problem. The computation of the diameter, or at least this version, this decision version, reduced to a search problem. Okay? And the idea is to use a technique called quantum search to do this, the Grover search, essentially. So I will explain more carefully how it works. The so Grover algorithm. So Grover algorithms can be understood as follows. So you have a function f over set x, which is a Boolean function, so the, it's output 0 or 1, which is, a Boole, which is given as a black box. So you have some kind of black box algorithm when you have x here, you input x, the output is fx. And the goal is to find an element x such that fx is equal to one. Of course, classically, this can be done um, by trying uh, all the elements. Of course, the trivial solution, you try all the elements in large x until you find some x such that fx is equal to one. But you can actually show that you cannot do better unless the function f has a special structure. And Grover search shows that actually in the quantum setting, you can do much better. There is a quantum algorithm that solves a problem with complexity big O square root the size of X. Okay, so quadratically faster than this classical algorithm, brute force search, which is optimal classically unless you have some knowledge about the function. Okay, and you can use this uh, in many applications, for example, to give some speed up for NP complete problem and so on, uh, but I will skip this application. I will come back to the diameter. So the diameter is again to decide if there exists a vertex U, such as the eccentricity is larger than D. So if you take the function F of the previous slide, as the functions that output one if the eccentricity is larger than D, 
our goals become finding a u such that f u is equal to one. Okay, and this is exactly the setting of the previous slide. So we can use Grover algorithm, and we know that there is an algorithm that solves this problem using square root n calls to the black box evaluating this function f. Okay. N here is the size of v, the number of vertices in the graph. Good. Okay. And Oh, the quantum distributed algorithm for computing the diameter works as follows. The network will elect a leader. Okay, so you have many graphs, you elect a leader, for example, the, the, the node with the smallest ID. There are many ways of uh, electing a leader. It's very simple to do. And once you have a leader, you ask the leader to simulate this algorithm, Grover, Grover search. So in order to simulate Grover search, what you will need is to be able to simulate the call to the function f. Okay, And what is a function f? It's a function that essentially computes the eccentricity. So in order to implement one call of this black box, you will need to compute the eccentricity of one specific vertex. And to do this, the node the leader will need to communicate with the other nodes. So each call to the black box will be implemented by executing the d round classical algorithm computing the eccentricity that I presented in the previous slides. But besides the calls to the black box, all the quantum computation will be done locally by the leader. So what will be the round complexity of this approach? It's the number of calls to the black box time, the round complexity of implementing each call to the black box. It's a D round, you have the D. Let's give you this complexity. And with further work, you can reduce the complexity to square root nd. Okay, it's not very difficult, a little bit technical, but not very difficult. So you get the square root nd here. Okay, and the lower bound, well, I won't really talk about that, but they are approved Exact, similarly to the classical lower bounds by uh, using techniques from uh, communication complexity. So you have the same theory of communicate, quantum version of uh, communication complexity. So you can use that quantum version and this give you uh, this kind of point. Okay, so to, to summarize the second part of that talk, uh, as a, actually the last part of that talk, uh, we obtained so essentially this upper bound which is a sublinear quantum computation of the diameter in the congeas model when d is small. Okay. Okay, and the very nice thing with uh, what I described is that you can think of it as a general recipe to build a quantum distributed algorithm. Okay. So when you have a problem of distributed computing where the bottleneck is to find one good element. And when you are able to check whether an element is good fairly easily, then you should be able to apply the same distributed version of a Grover search I explained in the previous slides to obtain a speed up. Okay. Okay, so this really looks like a, a very um, a promising research area. You should be able to apply that technique to many, many other uh, classical distributed algorithms. Okay, so to summarize uh, the whole talk, uh, so I've shown that um, in the congest model, you can compute faster uh, the diameter in the quantum set. I also mentioned that in the local model, the local model is the other model where there is no limit on the bandwidth of communication, then there is a huge gap between classical and quantum. Okay, quantumly you can solve some artificial problem on a ring on two rounds and classically n rounds, so a huge gap between the two. And interesting research direction, the first thing will be to um, consider other applications of the quantum distributed algorithm in the first model, the congest model I mentioned. 
we, uh, as I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, there we have a, a second result, which is the quantum algorithm for the triangle finding, which is faster than the classical the class triangle finding distributed algorithm. The second thing is a local model, the model where uh, with arbitrary bandwidth. I say that there exists some problem for which there is a gap, but the problem is artificial. It would be very interesting to find a concrete useful problem for which there is a gap between classical and quantum in that model. And another very important um, issue is to consider other models. So there are many other models, models beyond uh, congest and local in distributed computing. And for all of them, you can start considering a quantum version and ask if the quantum version is better than the classical version. And we did this uh, recently, for example, there's a congest click model. We showed that the quantum version is faster. There's also a concept of distributed verification, interactive proofs in the in distributed um, setting. And we proved that the quantum version is also faster than the classical version. So there are many, many other things that you can do. So taking a new, uh, computational model in a distributed computing and considering the quantum version and asking whether there is a gap between the classical and the quantum version. Okay, thank you for your attention and I will stop here. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, uh, I guess we can have questions in French or in English. Oui, bien sûr, en français, en, en, en anglais. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. Euh, on s'est déjà un peu vraiment remercié chaleureusement oui. pour le, le, cet exposé. Je ne sais pas s'il y a des questions dans, parmi une audience, Donc, euh, soit par écrit, soit euh, ouvrez vos micros. Euh. Oh, Vas-y, Yann, je crois. Euh, oui, oui j'avais une question. Euh, donc, dans dans l'algorithme que vous nous avez montré, euh, il me semble que le, le fait que les, euh, les canaux ne soient des canaux quantiques, ce n'est pas forcément euh, utile. Quoi. On peut faire ça avec des... Enfin, le, 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 finalement, le calcul de la, de la, de la boîte noire, il, il est fait euh, voilà, classique. Euh, Donc, euh... En fait, c'est un point très, très, très subtil et très important. Donc, en fait, je vais peut-être sortir ici. Donc, j'ai juste ici... Voilà, j'avais une slide que je n'avais pas montrée. C'est celle-là, c'est subtilité. Okay. Et en fait, là, quand je dis euh, que l'algorithme quantique appelle la black noire, il doit appliquer la black noire en superposition. Donc, pour, pour que ça marche, il ne faut pas que la, il faut que la, la black noire soit quantique. Il faut qu'on ait une version de la black noire qui accepte en entrée une superposition quantique et retourne okay. une superposition de la sortie. OK, OK, OK. Et en fait, on a un, un théorème qui dit qu général, que, que tout, tout, cal, tout calcul classique peut être converti en un calcul quantique qui accepte l'entrée en superposition et euh, calcule... Euh, les, les FU en superposition. Mm -hmm. Et pour faire ça, il faut que l'on autorise les communications quantiques. Donc, pour okay. implémenter okay. cette blague noire, il faut avoir des communications quantiques. Ok, merci. Merci, c'était ça qui me manquait, effectivement. Mais c'est un point très important. Euh, euh, oui. Merci. Emmanuel Oui, bon, bonjour, merci pour la, la présentation. Euh, J'ai une petite question pour la, la comparaison entre, et c'est peut-être lié à, ce, à, à cette diapo que tu viens de présenter. Euh, Lorsqu'on compare aux algorithmes classiques, on compare des algorithmes classiques à la fois probabilistes et déterministes. Euh, et en particulier, une de mes interrogations, c'est le lien entre des algorithmes Monte Carlo et des algorithmes quantiques, euh, d'une part. Et d'autre part, est-ce que ce serait long de nous présenter le, le problème particulier qui, euh, qui a une complexité, un, enfin un écart de complexité euh, de 2 à n 
D'accord. Donc, pour la première question, euh, Monte Carlo, ça dépend un peu comment on définit Monte Carlo, mais Monte Carlo, euh, c'est une version probabiliste, euh, c'est ça Ce serait la. Mais il y, y a des erreurs, c'est-à-dire que ça se, ça se termine, mais bah, on va avoir des erreurs sur l'exactitude le, du résultat. D'accord, 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 d'accord. Voilà, d'accord. Donc, en fait, les bornes inférieures que j'ai présentées euh, un peu partout, enfin, les, les bornes classiques inférieures, elles sont même pour les algorithmes classiques probabilistes, donc Monte Carlo aussi. Donc là, je compare vraiment quantique et euh, classique Monte Carlo, classique déterministe ou classique probabiliste. Et, et résoudre au sens quantique, c'est avoir probabilité 1 d'avoir le résultat euh, non, 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 c'est un très bon point. En quantique, euh, ça n'a pas vraiment de sens de, de parler de calcul exact quantique. Parce que pour, déjà en pratique, il y a toujours euh, des erreurs un peu partout. Et même parce qu'en quantique, il faut, il faut, on a des, des, des portes quantiques avec des entrées qui sont 1 sur racine carré de 2, des choses comme ça, des choses qui sont impossibles à implémenter physiquement de manière exacte. Il y a toujours une petite erreur en quantique. Donc, quand je dis quantique, c'est quand je dis que ça calcule, je dis que ça calcule avec grande, grande probabilité. On peut mettre très, très proche de 1, mais c'est jamais exactement 1. D'accord, merci. Voilà. Et pour la deuxième question, euh, euh, le problème est relativement facile à, à décrire. Euh, Donc, on a le réseau quantique en deux rounds. Les, les nœuds vont créer un, un état quantique qui est partagé, qui est global, qui peut être créé très facilement. Ce qu'on appelle un graph state. Graph state, c'est un concept en, en informatique quantique. C'est un type d'état quantique. Un, un état quantique qui est très facile à créer de manière locale. On, simplement, on communique avec ses voisins. Chaque nœud communique avec son voisin, échange un ou deux qubits, quantum bits, et avec ça, il crée un, 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 un état quantique. Et après, tous les nœuds mesurent cet état quantique. Donc, ils mesurent, donc ils reçoivent la, la, le résultat du, de la mesure, c'est 0 ou 1, un seul bit, 0 ou 1. Et il, 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 donc il reçoit 0 et 1, et il donne en sortie, il simplement sort ce, le résultat de cette mesure, 0 ou 1. D'accord Donc chaque nœud a pour output 0 ou 1, qui est le résultat de la mesure de leur, leur qubit de l'état quantique. Donc c'est vraiment très simple, et on peut montrer, c'est très facile à montrer, qu'en classique, il est absolument impossible de. Euh, d'obtenir la même sortie, à moins de communiquer énormément. Et, et donc, cette mesure, ça mesure une propriété du, du graphe, c'est un graph state Voilà, c'est un euh... graph state, exactement. Donc, on utilise, et... en fait, c'est suffisant d'avoir un ring, donc un anneau. Oui. Voilà. Et, et ça mesure quoi sur le... intuitivement <rire> En fait, c'est ça le problème, c'est pour ça que je dis que c'est artificiel. Ça mesure la corrélation quantique qui apparaît lorsqu'on mesure un graph state correspondant à un anneau. Et ces corrélations ne peuvent pas euh, être simulées classiquement de manière locale. Il faut que, que tout le monde communique, communique de manière globale pour pouvoir harmoniser les résultats pour obtenir la même distribution. C'est un espèce de, de, de coin tossing glo global, c'est ça Ou... Voilà, c'est voilà, un peu, il y a les expériences de Bell et tout ça, et là, on le fait de manière globale, donc on a des corrélations quantiques, qui sont très faciles à créer de manière quantique, mais classiquement, c'est impossible de les créer, à moins vraiment de, de, de centraliser toute l'information, ce qui demande... De, c'est un nano, ça demande d'envoyer de, de, toute l'information à un nœud de l'anno, ça, ça prend n sur deux rounds, donc c'est énorme au niveau de ces parties. Voilà. Merci beaucoup.